Hey there, this is Erica Kelly, host of the podcast, Southern Fraud True Crime. Each week, I take a look at a different Southern crime, and like any good gossip, I'm interested in anyone or anything. I cover contemporary and historical cases, and I love listener suggestions. Come join me as I explore the dark underbelly of the Deep South. I'm a one-woman show in a narrative format, kind of like sitting by the fire and listening to a story. So pull up a chair and subscribe if you're interested. I'd love to have you. You can find me on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and just about any podcast platform. Just search for Southern Fried True Crime. Until then, y'all take care. Canada, the Great White North, a utopia of manners, health care, and big-hearted people saying A. Hey. Sadly, that place doesn't exist. I'm Jordan, and on my show Nighttime, I uncover a version of Canada that is far darker than the one used in advertising to sell coffee, beer, and cars. The Canada I discuss on Nighttime is a twisted maze of crime, missing persons cases, unexplained events, and stories that prove Canada is not what they want you to think. If you want to join me, subscribe to the Nighttime Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else. At 11 p.m. on October 4th, 2011, Arlene Miller's 15-year-old daughter woke her up and said that about a half dozen Amish men were at the farmhouse back door demanding to speak with Arlene's husband, Myron. What happened next would make international news and lead to federal hate crime charges for a number of Amish men. From the south shore of Lake Erie, this is Great Lakes True Crime. Before we start with this episode, I just wanted to thank everyone for your patience as we ended up taking the entire month of May off. That wasn't by plan originally, but it ended up being necessary for a number of reasons. Also, thanks to those of you who follow the show on Twitter and Facebook, and to those of you who have given us positive reviews on your podcast app. It really helps, and we really appreciate it here at Great Lakes True Crime. So let's get into episode 15. The term Amish refers to groups of Christian church fellowships with Swiss, German, and Anabaptist origins. They're closely related to Mennonite churches but have some distinct differences. Their customs include simple living, plain dress, and a reluctance to adopt many forms of our modern technology. The Amish movement began in 1693 with a schism among Anabaptists in Switzerland. The schism was led by a man named Jacob Amon, and those who chose to follow Amon became known as Amish. In the second half of the 19th century, the Amish divided into Old Order Amish and Amish Mennonites. The Amish Mennonites live a more modern lifestyle and drive cars, while the Old Order Amish have kept much of their traditional culture. When the term Amish is used today, it typically refers to the Old Order Amish, which is the more traditional of the two groups. In the early 18th century, many Amish, as well as Mennonites, emigrated from Europe to Pennsylvania in the United States for a number of reasons. Today, the Old Order Amish, the New Order Amish, and the Old Beachy Amish continue to speak Pennsylvania German, which is also known as Pennsylvania Dutch. While the Amish and Mennonites originally settled in Pennsylvania, a large number have come to settle in Ohio over the years. Both states, Ohio and Pennsylvania, are now each home to approximately 80,000 Amish people. Nearly half of all Amish in the United States live in either Pennsylvania or Ohio. 
In Ohio, Holmes County contains the largest Amish population, although many Amish live in various counties throughout the rest of Northeast Ohio. They can frequently be seen riding in horse-driven buggies along the roads of Ohio. It's not uncommon to see various businesses, even large stores such as Walmart, provide hitching posts to accommodate their Amish customers and their horses. Back to that October night in 2011, 11 p.m. was long past calling hours for those seeking an audience with Myron, who was a bishop with the Mechanicstown Amish Church in northeast Ohio's Carroll County. When Myron reached the door, the men attacked him almost immediately, trying to force him outside. They were tugging on his long beard. They finally got him out on the cement out there and took a big pair of scissors and started to cut his beard, Arlene said. That attack, and a similar one in nearby Holmes County the same night, drew unwanted national attention to Ohio's Amish community and exposed a widening rift between mainstream Amish and the followers of Samuel Mullet, a 66-year-old bishop who ruled a breakaway group, a group that some people even called a cult, in an 800-acre compound outside the rural Jefferson County town of Bergholtz in eastern Ohio. The event also highlighted the strange punishment some say is doled out for crossing mullet. The hair and beard cuttings are meant to be degrading and causing serious harm to the Amish men. Once married, Amish men generally stop shaving and let their beards grow, while women do the same with their hair. The beards are held in high esteem for both religious and cultural contexts. Police say the five who attacked Myron that night were three sons and two other followers of Samuel Mullet. They had just traveled nearly two hours from their first attack at the home of Raymond Hirschberger, a 76-year-old Holmes County bishop. That was according to County Sheriff Tim Zimmerly. Similar to the approach they took with Myron, the men got into Raymond's house by saying they wanted to discuss religious matters. They held the bishop down in a chair and used scissors and battery-operated clippers to shave off his beard. Said Sheriff Zimmerly, they held him down and said, We are here for revenge for Sam Mullet. In one of the few interviews that Sam Mullet granted, he told the Associated Press that he didn't order the attacks, but acknowledged that he didn't exactly go out of his way to stop them either. Mullet also acknowledged knowing the purpose for the beard cuttings. He said they were intended to send a message to Amish people that they should be ashamed of themselves for calling his community a cult. Mullet was especially upset with Raymond Hirschberger for failing to honor the excommunication of two families that left Mullet's group and moved to Holmes County, according to Sheriff Zimmerly. Raymond was just one of many bishops across Northeast Ohio who criticized Mullet for his order to shun the families. And Mullet was upset with Myron Miller for a recent church order suggesting that Mullet's son, Bill, should shun his father. The Millers had helped the son leave his father's group in 2004, according to Arlene Miller. Our community church here, not just Myron, but the whole church, advised Bill that he shouldn't have anything to do with his dad, Arlene said. We believe that made Sam mad. As we said earlier, there were five men implicated in the attack, all of whom were arrested. They were 38-year-old Johnny Mullet, 37-year-old Daniel Mullet, 26-year-old Lester Mullet, as well as 53-year-old Levi Miller and his son, 32-year-old Eli Miller. Each of the men were charged with aggravated burglary and kidnapping. The three men were being held in Jefferson County Jail on a $250,000 bond each, pending extradition to Holmes County. They faced up to 20 years in prison if convicted on both felony counts in the Holmes County attack alone. After they were arrested, though, they went free on bond, that $250,000 bond. It was posted by none other than Samuel Mullet. Around that same time, a Carroll County grand jury had to decide if similar charges would be brought against the five men for their attack on 45-year-old Bishop Miller, according to County Prosecutor Don Burns. Sam Mullet was not initially charged, even though Jefferson County Sheriff Fred Abdallah said he believes that Sam Mullet orchestrated the attacks on the bishops. The sheriff was certainly not alone in that sentiment. It's difficult to believe Mellert wasn't behind it. 
Sheriff Abdallah was quoted as saying, He's saying that he didn't do it, but they consulted with him. They had a meeting with him. He knew who all the targets were going to be. He sanctioned it, and he sure as hell never told them to not go. Abdallah went on to say that one of the suspects even told him, quote, If the Clippers didn't break, we were going to get four more guys that night. End quote. The night of October 4th, 2011, Myron and Arlene Miller had not yet heard about the attacks that had just occurred in Holmes County. They were on edge, though, because they had gotten word that members of the Bergholtz group had attacked a Trumbull County couple on September 6th. That news had spread like wildfire through the close-knit Amish community. A dozen Amish attackers in that case included several of the couple's sons and a son-in-law who cut the man's beard and the woman's hair. That woman, the female victim, was Sam Mullet's sister, according to Sheriff Abdallah, but she and her husband refused to press charges against her brother. The news of that attack made the Millers feel very suspicious when the men showed up to discuss, quote, religious matters that night, and it also helped prepare Myron to fight off the five attackers. Arlene said, as they started to cut his beard, Myron said he felt something just come over him, and he pushed and grabbed for all he was worth to get loose. While eventually managing to wiggle free from their grip, Myron had unwillingly, and ironically, torn one of his attacker's beards, leaving behind clumps of hair that police used to help identify the suspects. Scared off by the strong resistance put up by Myron, the five ran off to a red Dodge truck and a horse trailer parked on the country lane in front of the Miller's property. Myron chased them and got a good look at it as the truck pulled off. Stumbling across his lawn back to his house, barefoot and disheveled, Myron kept mumbling something to himself again and again. It was the truck's license plate number, which led police to easily identify the driver, who in turn led them to those responsible for the crime. The driver had originally taken 27 Amish people to a horse auction in Holmes County, with 21 riding in the back trailer earlier in the day, he told authorities. That's about the most Amish thing I've ever heard, by the way. On Tuesday afternoon at the Jefferson County Jail, a group of three TV reporters stood waiting next to the vending machines. They were expecting Sam Mullet to pop out of the elevators at the end of the hall any minute. Mullet was visiting two of his sons, Lester and Johnny, who soon would be moved to the Holmes County Jail. Sure enough, here came old Sam Mullet strolling down the hall wearing a blue work shirt, blue jeans with black suspenders, a white hat with a brown band and black shoes. His long white beard was untrimmed, and he was trailed by three teenage girls wearing dark navy traditional Amis dresses. Nice. The cameras started rolling, and a pair of TV reporters began to fire questions at him. Did you get a chance to talk to your sons? Did you order them to cut off their beards? But slowly and purposefully, Mullet walked down the corridor and turned a corner to leave the building. He silently mouthed the words, thank you, to the receptionist, and headed out the door with the reporters closely behind him. Mullet ducked under a tree branch on the sidewalk as the reporters continued to shout questions at him. He climbed into the passenger side of a white station wagon while the three girls got in the back seat. Mullet said something to the male driver and they both laughed before driving off. He never said a word to the reporters and didn't acknowledge any of their questions. Located in a hilly, sparsely populated rural area in northwest Jefferson County, the tiny hamlet of Bergholtz has a motto of wooded hills and warm hearts and a pitching post in front of the town's Huntington Bank branch. It also has only one restaurant. That's Marshall's Restaurant and Carryout. Some reporters went there, and they poked around the restaurant after Mullet got his attention on local TV. The small early lunch crowd there seemed more amused than anything by the attention that Mullet's group was getting from the outside world. I can't believe how far it's gone, said one Bergholtz resident sitting at the lunch counter. It was on Jay Leno, and my niece from Dayton called me and said, What's going on in your town? For many years, rumors circulated around the area regarding Mullet and his followers, and the rumors were never positive about them. 
A common phrase was heard in Amish country. It was, you just head past the coal mine on your right and the Amish school on your left, and turn left, and you're in mullet territory. One Bergholz resident said she wasn't surprised to hear about the beard-cutting attacks attributed to members of the mullet group. She said she heard of several other group members having had their beards cut off in early 2011 as punishment. They just showed up one day and their beards were gone. They said it was punishment, but they didn't really say for what. I assumed it was for working outside the group, said the woman, who asked that her name not be used, fearful of mullet's retaliation. The mullet compound sits in a valley about five miles outside of Bergholz, down a winding dirt road with a one-room Amish schoolhouse serving as the landmark next to the road. When reporters from the Cleveland Plain Dealer visited the compound, it was deserted, even though as many as 17 families, almost all related to Mullet, were said to be living there back at the time of the attacks. Their group had apparently taken off and traveled to Holmes County to turn in the last two of the five men arrested in the case. In that interview that Mullet gave to the Associated Press, he said he was upset that other bishops were interfering with his right to punish the members of his group that weren't following the rules. He said he should be allowed to punish people who break the laws of his church, just as others are punished by law enforcement when they break laws. You have your laws on the road in the town. If somebody doesn't obey them, you punish them, he told the AP. But I'm not allowed to punish the church people. I just have to let them run over me. If every family would just do as they pleased, what kind of church would you have? So that statement clearly shows the extremist sort of mindset that Mullet had at the time, that a religious organization should be permitted to physically attack its members as punishment for breaking the rules. But guess who would have never had his beard cut off under this type of scenario, though? It's kind of like the religious leaders who hear God tell them that they should take multiple wives. It's funny that God never tells them that their wife should take multiple husbands. It's kind of funny how that works with the leaders. Anyway, although Mollet's antics didn't come to light publicly until 2011, David McConnell, an anthropology professor at the nearby College of Worcester, said Mullet had been long infamous for doing this type of thing. McConnell, who is a co-author of the book called An Amish Paradox, which focused on the Amish settlements in Holmes County, he said that Mullet has long been considered a renegade by other Amish groups who rules his church members with an iron fist. Even before all this broke, he was out in left field, McConnell said. No other Amish church district would affiliate or have fellowship with them. That in itself is a powerful statement of how isolated he is from the mainstream. McConnell said no Amish bishop he knows of would condone cutting hair or beards as punishment. The fact that he has lashed out and retaliated against other Amish bishops in a way that is so inconsistent with Amish values is the best illustration of why he's an outlier, McConnell said. He added that it's highly unusual for an Amish bishop to go to police with their disputes, other than for something like property theft. He said that they prefer to deal with those type of conflicts internally, and the fact that they did go to police shows how serious they viewed those acts. McConnell added, quote, I was told the bishops decided to go to law enforcement not because they were humiliated, but because they viewed the potential future threat from Sam Mullet as something that needs intervention from law enforcement. The professor said his Amish friends in Holmes County almost all regard Mullet's group as a cult. Most of them have used that kind of language, he said. I've been struck by how quickly they have disavowed him and distanced themselves from Mullet. As Arlene sat in a wooded chair near the back door of her farmhouse, she confirmed that bringing charges against the attackers who roughed up her husband is very difficult for the Amish. We're not pressing charges for revenge. We're pressing charges because they need help, she said. That community's messed up bad, and there's a lot of children there. Jefferson County Sheriff Abdallah said he heard reports that Mullet had abused other members of his community. In one example, he was said to have kept people in chicken coops as punishment. 
Others said he engaged in marathon religious lectures that left members sleep-deprived and physically exhausted. Now, I'll be honest, this really does sound like torture to me. I'm really starting to understand the power he has to brainwash these people, Sheriff Abdallah said. I think a lot of the people who live out there are going to end up needing psychological counseling for what they have been through. Well, eventually the law caught up to Mullet and he was brought up on charges. The trial of Samuel Mullet and 15 co-defendants had widespread interest due in part to the mysterious lifestyle of the Amish as well as the types of charges that were brought up. The defendants were charged with hate crimes, which were filed under a law that makes an attack a federal crime if it was committed because of actual or perceived race, color, religion, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, or disability. It was the first hate crime trial to be held in Ohio. The other charges included conspiracy, evidence tampering, and obstruction of justice. Some of the defendants, including Mullet, were looking at prison terms of 20 years or more if convicted. So Mullet and the co-defendants went on trial in August 2012 in the U.S. District Court for Northern Ohio, which is based in Cleveland. In the trial, it was revealed that aside from the beard trimming attacks, it seemed that Mullet, not surprisingly, was up to some other heinous activities. One witness in the trial told the jury that she gave in to the sexual demands of Mullet after repeated approaches. Shocker, I know. That witness, it turns out, was Samuel Mullet's daughter-in-law. She testified that she and other women in the Bergholz community gave in to Mullet's demands that they have sex with him. Nancy Mullet, who lives in Greenville, Pennsylvania, said Samuel Mullet started out wanting hugs and kisses and then expected them to sit on his lap. He would tell her she had to do it in order to help her husband, Eli, who had suffered a mental breakdown, get better. Nancy Mullet said she stayed in Samuel Mullet's house while her husband was hospitalized on two different occasions. And the second of the two hospital stays was prompted by Eli Mullet learning that his father had asked his wife to sit on his lap, she said. Nancy Mullet said she was told by Sam Mullet that she couldn't go home because the devil would get her. Well, one night while staying at Samuel's house, a woman came to her room and said that Sam wanted her to come down to his bedroom. She refused at first, but then gave in when the woman came back a second time. Sam Mullet wanted to have sex, she said, but Nancy said she refused. I mean, first of all, this is her creepy father-in-law, and on top of that, Nancy was a married woman. So the trial wrapped up in September 2012. A jury of seven men and five women deliberated for 37 hours over five days. Samuel Mollett was convicted of federal hate crimes and conspiracy for encouraging his followers to forcibly shear the hair and beards of those who opposed his breakaway group. Mullet's three sons, his daughter, and 11 other family members and followers from his clan were convicted of conspiracy and hate crimes after a trial that had attracted massive amounts of attention from around the globe. But the story does not end there. In August 2014, nearly two years later, a federal appeals court overturned the hate crimes convictions of Mullet and the 15 others who were found guilty for the beard-cutting attacks. The ruling was made in the U.S. Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. That court took issue with U.S. District Judge Dan Aaron Polster's jury instructions, which the court said were faulty based on the definition of a hate crime. The bishop maintained that the attacks were based on family disputes rather than religion. In response to this overturning of the convictions, the U.S. Attorney's Office released a statement saying, We respectfully disagree with the two judges who reversed the defendant's hate crime convictions based on a jury instruction. We remain in awe of the courage of the victims in this case, who were subject to violent attacks by the defendants. We are reviewing the opinion and considering our options. 
and one of the fears was that the convictions would be tossed out and a new trial be ordered. Fortunately for the victims, though, that didn't happen. Instead, Cleveland-based U.S. District Judge Polster resentenced all of them to shorter sentences in March 2015 and noted that it was clear that the attacks were religiously motivated. Sam Mullet's sentence was reduced from 15 years to 10. Mullet and his attorney attempted to appeal again to the United States Supreme Court, but in May 2018, the Supreme Court declined to hear the case. Today, Samuel Mullet is 73 years old. He's the only one of the group of 15 to still be serving time in prison. He is currently housed in the Elkton Federal Correctional Institution in Lisbon, Ohio, which is in northeast Ohio and not far from his home. He's scheduled for release on April 3rd, 2021. That wraps up this episode of Great Lakes True Crime. Again, if you really want to help out the show, please leave us a five-star review. You can follow the show on Facebook and Twitter. Just search for Great Lakes True Crime. This has been your host and producer, Steve. Thanks for listening, guys. <laughs>